Hi, everybody. I'm Debbie Levitt from Delta CX, and uh, let me start my slides as I tell you about my world. Hold on a moment, please. Let's see if this looks right. Okay, here we go. So uh, welcome to Improving Agility by Using Customers' Definitions of Quality and Done. I've been working in CX and UX since 1995. I'm a strategist, architect, trainer, speaker, lots of things, not an artist. Uh, Delta CX is my full service CX and UX agency. You can check us out at deltacx.com. And clients call me Mary Poppins because I fly in, fix everything I can, sing a few songs and fly away to where I'm needed next. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can find me on the interwebs, uh, mostly on LinkedIn as Debbie Lovett. And I am on YouTube going live all the time, seemingly. Uh, very often at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Lithuania time uh, here in Italy, uh, 6.30 p.m. And so that's Delta CX. You'll also see little camera icons popping up on my slides. That just tells you my slide is done animating. If you like to screenshot slides or take a picture of them, it's a great time because uh, there are no more animations. And you'll also notice that I'm saying CX um, more than you might expect to hear. You might expect me to talk about UX. They're nearly the same thing, but CX is coming up the last few years as a broader and more appropriate term for what we do. So I'll explain that later. So let's jump in. Agile has definitions of done and quality that are supposed to be about making sure the product is done right and is high quality. But in our agile world, how do we define quality? Velocity, productivity, and efficiency? Improved software performance? Fewer no bugs? Meet stakeholder requirements? What about our definition of done? We did what we planned? It fit business objectives? It's coded, tested, documented, and deployable. There's something huge missing here. Does our product match our customers' and users' definitions of quality and done? Does it fit their tasks and needs? Did the system optimize or complicate a workflow? A quick note, in case I take the whole time today and don't have time for questions, my email is on every slide. I would love to answer questions by email in case I don't get to your question. So how do you decide when an experience you're having at a restaurant is high or low quality? It might be the look or design of the restaurant, how the staff treat you, how the place smells, how clean it seems to be, the presentation of the food, the price of the food, the flavor of the food, how you feel a few hours after eating the food, and more. You have multiple criteria for quality in nearly everything in your life. Our users and customers have lots of criteria they use to judge our products and services. So why do we use minimally viable definitions of quality and done? Code with few or no bugs can be called quality code, but food without bugs can still be low quality food. Poor quality ingredients, bad recipe, bad chef, or any combination of these can kill our restaurant experience even if we didn't find any bugs. When we're disconnected from how our users and customers define quality and done, we're going down the wrong path. We claim that we're focused on customer satisfaction, supporting and empowering our teammates, allowing time in our process for good or great design, and being lean by cutting waste and reducing work we shouldn't do. But I've pretty much never seen these happening anywhere I've worked or my friends have worked. Are these really happening on your team? Are we using retros to identify problems and waste and then truly fixing those problems and cutting that waste? Instead, we fill our world with catchy sayings that we use as excuses to not be agile or lean. Just ship it, often without knowing if it's the right solution for our customers. We'll fix it later. How will we fix it later? And how often do we fix it later? When is later? What will we have to delay and what will it cost? Users will have to figure it out or they will flood you with support tickets or they'll cancel, leave and give up. Fail fast. There's nothing cool about failing fast or slowly when paying or trial customers suffer with your failure. If you're not embarrassed, you shipped too late. 
Does this mean that our goal is to be embarrassed by our products? Most of us would prefer to feel proud that our product is great and it's a match to our customers' needs and tasks. Lean is the least we can do to get us to the next step. Lean disagrees. This is a bastardization of lean that seemed to come from the lean startup book. Anybody who has studied Toyota's original approach to lean or lean Six Sigma knows that lean isn't the least we can get away with doing. It's about identifying and cutting waste. Fake lean is wasteful and takes us down the wrong paths, which means we should cut fake lean for not being lean. Move fast and break things. Sure, only if you fix those things before the public struggles with them. It's good enough for the engineering team, for stakeholders, or for our paying or trial customers. We've been experimenting with speed over quality methods for years now, and it should be pretty clear from our project costs, ROI, customer support tickets, tweets about us, our stock price, and other hints that this doesn't exactly work. We must stop praying to the false gods of speed and give your customers broken things. We must stop using any of these excuses for low effort and failures. When I speak at conferences like this, I ask the audience full of engineers to raise their hands if they've ever known while building something that it wasn't right for target users. I can't see you, but I bet you're raising your hand because usually every hand goes up. You know you're building something of poor quality that might have to be fixed or undone later, but nobody feels empowered to say anything. Like assembly line robots, you're being judged by how much you get done. Creating a higher quality product means spending more time and money up front, but instead someone says, we'll fix it later. But we hide that fix in some other budget and call the original project that caused all the problems a success. And isn't it amazing that we never have time to create a better product now, but we'll have time later to stop a future project to fix this old one? It's scary to think about stopping the agile train because somebody realized late in the game that we're building something that doesn't match customers' needs. But it should be scarier to imagine burning our time, resources, budget, and customer trust on something that doesn't match what customers need. Agile welcomes change even late in the game, even if we have to change the project requirements, which might mean changing the product itself. If our systems aren't right for every user interacting with them, can we congratulate ourselves for having an efficient engineering process? If Agile is supposed to be about welcoming change, even later in a process, why do we reward silence and avoid holding people accountable for disaster projects? Workers and teams who are afraid to stop a project that's likely to fail signify culture problems that will need improvement. In the old days, when what the customer needed didn't overlap what the business wanted to do or sell people, you built what the business wanted. You hired more marketing and salespeople to figure out how you were going to make people think they wanted this. Those are the dinosaur days, but they're not extinct just yet. Therefore, instead of our Venn diagram looking like customer needs and business goals are on two distant islands, we must bring these together. That's not done by pushing customers into what we think we can sell them or what we can force or trick them into doing. It's done by shifting business goals, strategies, and initiatives to match our customers. It's done by making customer centricity part of our strategy. It's done by CX and UX. CX and UX, aren't those the people who keep interrupting my work to bring me into hours or days of workshops so we can create empathy? Sadly, it might be, but I'm doing everything I can to burn that time-wasting workshop crap to the ground. When you think about people who work in CX or UX, you probably imagine artsy-fartsy hipsters who sketch screens or make screens pretty. But most of us aren't artsy-fartsy hipsters, and there's a lot more going on in CX and UX than many people realize. The core and foundations of our work are cognitive psychology and human behavior, not art. Mitigating risk. 
The main process most CX and UX practitioners use is called UCD, user-centered design. You'll sometimes see this as HCD, human-centered design. It has multiple phases, including research, content strategy, information architecture, interaction design, usability testing, and iteration. Each phase has multiple tasks that can be done. CX professionals must approach this process strategically, deciding which tasks are needed, how long those will take, in what order we'll do them, and what resources are required. Order does matter here because each phase is informed by the phases that came before it. Our research informs everything we do later. Information architecture informs interaction design. You always hear a lot about models that say things like learn, build, and test. That's an oversimplification considering all of the tests any of us take to learn, build, and test. But learning, building, and testing and improving are baked into our process. And you're already familiar with what we call interaction design. These are our wireframes, prototypes, and other blueprints of how this lays out, how it works, and how people interact with it. But you might not know about all the other phases of our process that make our interaction design work good. If we care about quality, then we care about the quality of the process and the outcomes it can create. It's also why when CX and UX are asked to just guess at the build phase and make some wireframes, often without researching or testing, it's another high-risk guessing adventure that's likely to lead our project or company down the wrong path. It's the lean sin of underutilized talent when we only get enough time or budget for CX or UX to guess at screens when there's so much risk mitigating science and technique in our process. Research is the most important CX phase. It's not user-centered without users. We primarily want to observe them since you can learn a lot about who people are, their tasks, needs, and goals by watching them. Interviews are excellent when we ask the right questions the right ways, but since what people say and what people do aren't the same, observational studies are best. Statistics and quantitative data are nice, but there's no substitute for observing and interviewing users, deeply understanding them, and getting qualitative data. CX wants to know the what, why, and how, and not just the how many. Every step of research is important. Planning, writing interview and task guides, recruiting participants, executing the research, interpreting it, evaluating what we found, and arriving on actionable insights. Researchers find the root causes and all of their outcomes and consequences. Researchers are problem-finding detectives. Usability testing happens during our process and before engineering writes a line of code. We need to make sure that the idea and the execution of the idea are fantastic for our target users. We don't want engineering to build it until we're sure this is what should be built. Testing is the QA of CX and UX. We don't skimp on or exclude QA for our code, even when our developers are really smart and talented. So why would we rush out untested product concepts? Usability testing will bring to light any flaws, giving us the chance to iterate on ideas. Iteration and refinement are a mini cycle of their own. Build, test, learn. And you can also understand why if you see UX as wireframing some screens, which is one task from one phase of user-centered design, a broader term like CX might help people better understand the whole of what we do. All the customer knows is the CX and the UX. That's it. They don't see a thousand developers or whether you were agile or lean. They don't know if you had an agile mindset, a project mindset, or any other mindset or religion. They only know the system or site you expected them to use. What's the last website, app, or system you used that you really loved? It solved your problems. It helped you get your tasks done efficiently. It's hard to think of one, isn't it? Would your users put your products and systems on the list of what they really love? We want that answer to be yes. When you use a system that frustrates you, you're probably not thinking, I wonder how many sprints they spent on that. When something doesn't work the way you expected it to, you're probably thinking, who built this junk? 
And that's a good question. Who researched with users like you to learn your habits, motivations, needs, tasks, and then architect and design for them? Was this tested on people like you before it was unleashed on the public? Does the quality of work matter? Of course it does. That's why we hire programmers who are really great at coding. Therefore, we need to talk a little bit about the difference between professionals and experts doing CX and UX work and non-CX and UX people stabbing at our mission-critical tasks. My phases of proficiency model reminds us of why you can't give CX work to just anybody. You can't tell engineers to read a CX book or take an online course and then do what experts and specialists do. You'd be doing CX work in the building blocks phase where we're focused on tools, templates, and tasks, but nobody is judging how well you did something. Hand me a hammer or a saw and I won't use those tools the way a senior carpenter does. I'm not even at junior carpenter level. I'm at the building blocks level. Science and technique are the how or how well of what we're doing. It moves past the mechanical act of performing a task and looks at the quality, depth, style, and approach to the work being done. Science and critical thinking turn a task into a technique. Talking to users is a building block. But did you ask good questions or crappy, flawed questions? Now we're getting into technique. How was your research planned, recruited, executed, evaluated, and interpreted? That's science and technique. Sketching a screen is a building block, but did you create a completely accessible experience? Did your interaction design take correctly executed qualitative research findings and insights into account? Science and technique are what separates pros and specialists from everybody else. Strategy is why or when you would use your science and technique around the user-centered design process, as well as being able to predict and estimate how long the work will take. When do I do a card sort? When do I do interviews versus observational studies versus a survey? How long will each of these take and what resources do I need? Therefore, when we're considering who does CX work, we must consider their phase of proficiency. We don't want anybody toying with building blocks to do our mission critical work. Our coworkers, managers, leaders, and execs very rarely see the science and technique or the strategy that go into our work. They see wireframes, pretty screens, whiteboards, walls of sticky notes, and they think UX makes screens. Anybody can make wireframes and decide how products look and work. But the phases of proficiency are really an iceberg where people who are used to seeing just the tip of the iceberg without understanding what's going on below the surface don't have all the information. The iceberg model explains why agile and scrum coaches keep telling me that UX has easy work that anybody can do, like paper prototypes. This is so easy anybody can do it means we're in building block land, ignoring the quality of the work being done and ignoring the body of the iceberg, the cognitive psychology, interaction design, information architecture, accessibility, and other concepts, best practices, and skills that we need to create excellent paper prototypes or wireframes. I learned some basic coding in 1979. I learned HTML in 1995. I'm passionate about engineering, so I can code to production, right? Or am I just at the building blocks phase of proficiency? If you are squirming in your seat at the idea of your engineers having to work with or check my code, then you know what CX and UX are thinking every time we hear anybody can do UX work, or that engineers and product managers making some wireframes will be good enough for customers. Side note, I never make paper prototypes because they're not realistic. I don't ask people to react to sketches because they're too far from how users expect a product to look or work. I use Aksher to make realistic, highly interactive digital prototypes, not sponsored. How can I do decent research or testing if I'm showing people non-interactive paper? If our product isn't paper-based, then a paper prototype isn't the right tool or building block for the job. If we give teammates a little training in CX or UX, then can they do the work? 
Should the product manager do wireframes? Should the business analyst interview users? Or should engineers delay coding to do design? I have an easy method to determine if we should give CX or UX work to a product manager, engineer, or other non-CX role. If you had an open full-time CX or UX job at your company, would that non-CX role qualify for that job? No, they wouldn't qualify to work full-time in CX or UX at your company? Then let's please not give them CX or UX tasks or work of any kind. It's one of the many reasons why you don't hand me a DevOps book and then ask me to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. Instead, you hire an experienced DevOps professional. You wouldn't allow roles outside of DevOps to experiment with DevOps tasks. We shouldn't do this with CX. Trying to retrofit the wrong person into important tasks is bad for process, product quality, user satisfaction, and efficiency. Teammates stopping what they're doing to guess at my work will get less of their own work done. A qualified CX expert will be more efficient at CX tasks than some other roles stopping their mission-critical work to guess at ours. A cost-benefit analysis should drive that point home. Also, you can't have it both ways. You can't believe in an agile that treats humans like assembly line robots, measuring them by efficiency, productivity, and velocity, and then expect them to get less engineering work done to spend time guessing at CX and UX work. Because we care about user-centered design done correctly, we need to talk, though very quickly with my short session, about trendy approaches that pretend to be CX or UX, but are quite the opposite. Aspirologies is my made up word for pseudo methodologies that aspire to greatness, but will only end up as soon forgotten trends. We're not going to optimize products or improve our agility if we're using the wrong approaches or methods. So the short version, the main, even though it's a long slide, the main aspirologies you will run into are design sprints, design thinking, and so-called lean UX, which is neither lean nor UX. Aspirologies have some common characteristics you can easily recognize. Codependency. UX seems to need everybody to do their job for and with them. Disrespect of teammates' time. Aspirology workshops or exercises require teammates to stop what they're doing for hours or days. Reliance on assumptions. Aspirologies prioritize speed over quality. They increase business and project risk by running with guesses thinking that'll save time. Giving specialized work to non-specialists. Aspirologies love workshops where CX and UX work are done by those without CX knowledge, expertise, experience, skill, or talent. Yet where else would we do that? We don't hold workshops where everybody, including me, decides the back-end architecture. Democratizing or decentralizing CX is completely fake. Many non-UX roles demand to have authority over UX. They tell us we must democratize and let everybody make decisions about the user experience. Yet those roles never give up power or decisions in their own domain. We don't have the cross-functional team all making engineering decisions. Magically, the cries for democracy are only for UX. They apply to no other domain, which is how we know this is fake. Fake customer centricity. We pretend that we really care about customers and their satisfaction, but we guess who they are. We guess what they need. We don't observe or research the people we're building for. If we weren't so out of touch with our customers, we wouldn't be so surprised when our products or features experience failure. We pretend we have empathy or sympathy, but if we really cared about users' experiences, we wouldn't rush out garbage that doesn't solve customers' problems and improve their task accomplishment. Innovation and solution theater. How many never before seen world premiere ideas came out of these workshops? How many solutions were wrong, non viable, or were based on guesses versus being based on proper research? Vote for the winner. Somehow we don't all need to get together, brainstorm various product roadmaps, and then vote on our favorite roadmap. If we're customer centric, then we don't make any decisions without having researched and tested on real or potential customers. We shouldn't pick products or features like it's American Idol. 
Emotional outcomes, oh, those are great. Everybody enjoyed the workshop. But where are the real budget and ROI figures? What were our success criteria? Did our workshop even have success criteria? Enough buzzwords thrown in so that it sounds like CX, even if it's not. You'll hear about customer journey maps, personas, problem solving, prototypes, and testing. But if you remember the phases of proficiency, this is all just building blocks in theater. You might hear buzzwords that sound like agile, like here's something we can do in one sprint. But there's a lot more to agile than did we do something in a one week time box. Collaboration is great, but design by committee, design thinking, design sprints, lean UX, and other aspirologies are wasteful. They're not as customer centric as they claim to be. With our short session today, I don't have time to go into more detail on each of these, but I've got hours of content on this uh, on my Aspirologies playlist in my Delta CX YouTube channel. So how do we bring customer centricity into Agile and improve our agility? In various flavors of Agile, CX is often a square peg someone is either trying to hammer into the round hole, or it's being taken off the board and thrown away for not fitting in. Siloed, excluded. We work differently than engineering. We have a different process, different goals and tasks. Instead of working to understand and improve process and collaboration, flavors of Agile often try to control CX and UX. This is going to cause conflict completely avoidable conflict. It wouldn't make sense for any one domain to demand that all other domains plan, think, prioritize, and work like they do. If you didn't really know about the user-centered design process, its phases and tasks, then there is a 100% chance that you will incorrectly estimate the time I need to do my work. But everywhere I've worked, other people guess at the time I need and surprise me at the kickoff me meeting. You just draw screens, so we were generous. Your final wireframes are due two days from today. I've heard that more than once. These incorrect estimations lead to interpersonal conflicts, projects appearing to be derailed or stalled by CX or UX, and rushing to push out a design that might be flawed, not having received enough iterations or testing. Product, project, portfolio, program managers, whoever you have, they should bring CX into earliest discussions so projects have the right budgets and timelines from the start. Agile teams should include the CX teammate in planning and estimation. Estimating our time is part of our strategic approach to a project. And let us measure time however we measure time. You might use sprints and fractals and t-shirts. We tend to think in days. But hey, as long as you have a populated backlog with things that you can build, who cares if you think in fractal broccoli and we think in half days? So what's the smallest, of un smallest unit of work U UX can pass to engineering? There was a viral video a few years ago showing an automatic soap dispenser installed above a power outlet. Your hand and possibly your power plug will be covered in wet soap just as you're connecting to live electricity. The caption I saw said, this is the reason we do integration testing as well as unit testing. That is a good engineering joke. And I realized it's also the reason why CX and UX architect and test complete workflows rather than separate pieces in isolation. If someone had tested a prototype of a soap dispenser over a power outlet, the problem would have been noticed before anything got installed. Lots of work and human pain saved. CX needs the big picture of the full user experience for whatever task users are trying to accomplish. We can't just design for small pieces separately and never test them together. We think in terms of the user's task, process, or workflow. We must build for the full arc of that task and test and improve it before we send it to engineering to be built. It's our version of acceptance testing. If the project is something smaller than a full customer workflow, of course, we can be nimble and we'd need less time. Not everything we do calls for a giant runway, but product, project, and engineering must be prepared for when a feature calls for that. This common template for sprint goals says, our focus is on achievement or outcome. 
we believe it delivers benefit or impact to customer. This will be confirmed when event happens. Supposedly, if you fill this out, you'll be really focused on users and outcomes. But that's not a guarantee, mostly because of one risky word here. Did you find it? It's believe. Imagine work goals being based on something someone believes, a guess or assumption. Shouldn't we know it's going to deliver certain benefits because the concept has been validated and vetted before we're planning engineering sprints around it? Believing, assuming, and being reactive aren't agile or lean. Six Sigma would be ashamed of you. Architecting for customers' needs and tasks and being agile shouldn't be the polar opposites they often are now. No matter what an agile coach, scrum master, or stakeholder declares, the customer decides what is quality, done, and good enough. If you don't use their definitions, you're going to have to deal later with failures. Every time Agile says that we want feedback from customers or we want to know if users find value in features, they're talking about CX research work. Our researchers generate knowledge and data about people and systems. They run studies to evaluate concepts. Every time we notice we're guessing, assuming, hypothesizing, making things up, or working based on what someone believes, we should let CX researchers study whatever it is so we can know. Traditional flavors of Agile are correct in saying that we must collect feedback from customers to know if our product has value and is considered high quality. But Agile and the MVP model um, seem to imagine that we have to collect that feedback after releasing our product, when our risks and costs are highest. Since Agile tends to exclude CX and UX processes and professionals, Agile doesn't realize that we can get that feedback through early concept testing of CX prototypes. Teams claiming to be Agile burn time and money to learn very late in the game that we've gone in the wrong direction. Learning this late that we need to fix or rework our product is really waterfall in disguise. Agile can pride itself on doing smaller batches of work and releasing products more frequently. But if you're continuously releasing garbage and not finding flaws until weeks or months later, your boat has just gone over the waterfall. The very earliest moments of project planning must also be focused on customers' needs. CX teammates should be part of project planning before we approve features that have low or no customer value. We used to do this. It was called R&D, research and development. Someone decided that R&D wasn't as cool as pretending that we were a startup and just rushing out guesses. Focusing on faster, faster, faster has lowered product quality and customer satisfaction. Think of CX as your lower cost and faster R&D team. If you have an R&D team, we would love to partner with them. We must get back to believing in R&D and R before D. I can show you this graphic on how CX needs to be two or more sprints ahead of engineering. I wrote a whole book on this. I can talk for hours about it. I can tell you about how CX needs to start before engineering because if we're populating the backlog with finalized designs, we have to start ahead of you. I can call what we do working in sprints. I can call it days. I can show you a variety of models of how CX and UX work with Agile, but I can make this really easy for you because all seven models on this screen say the same thing. CX is on its own track. We're not working on the same stories engineering is working on in the same sprint. We are weeks ahead, if not more. Once you can accept that Agile is about a predictable and reliable assembly line, we can all exhale. Put CX on its own track, cut the conflict and control, and get back to work. Instead of thinking of it as working with UX or adding some CX tasks to our process, think of it as customer centricity. What if you put users and everybody who will touch this product at the center of everything you did? Not what we think they need, not what we hope they need. We put those people at the center of everything we do. We research them. We architect and design for them. We test prototypes on them. And when it's right, now engineering can code it hopefully once. 
transforming towards customer centricity creates a lot of good new habits, processes, and collaborations. Imagine a future where requirements are more focused on users' needs and tasks and situations than they tend to be now. Imagine getting it right, or much closer to right, the first time so that we can know the right direction for products. This would save so much time later over having problems, finding root causes, and having to do rework. CX takes time and money up front, but it should save exponentially more when we eliminate the waste of guessing and releasing products that don't match our customers' needs. Here's how to make Agile truly customer-centric. One, build a world-class CX team of well-qualified practitioners. This is harder than it sounds because since most companies don't understand CX or UX, they just hired the person with a portfolio of pretty screens. They have no idea they were supposed to look for skills or abilities outside of art. That means I'd like to please direct you to my new and completely free training for HR recruiters and hiring managers on my Delta CX Academy website. Two, understand that CX's main role is customer research, advocacy, and shepherding customer value. If there is a battle between something the customer needs and something a stakeholder wants, we're more likely to side with the customer. We care about the business, but we often feel like we're the only people truly caring about the customers. When everybody is customer-centric, we won't look like lone weirdos we accuse of not speaking the business's language. We need more people to speak the customer's language. CX is part of our strategic approach to product. If we started with research and solid knowledge on all of the people who will use or interact with this product in any way, we can write better requirements and user stories. CX are collaborators to help shepherd customer value in requirements and stories. We estimate our time early in project planning, way before kickoff, and we get that time because people who care about agile, lean, and customer satisfaction recognize that getting our product right earlier pays off in time, money, morale, and more. Shift away from broken models and processes. The MVP is broken, but flavors of Agile don't seem to know what to do. Scrum.org has an article saying that minimum viable product would be improved if we called it minimal inspectable increment. That's not customer-centric. Minimal inspectable increment shows that old ways need complete reinvention, not slight renaming. Customers don't want something minimally viable. Stop holding aspirology workshops glorifying guessing and stop building MVPs. It doesn't ship if our target customers wouldn't see it as five-star quality. Out of five. Cut lean waste early. Scrap bad concepts before they're built. Product does not ship if it's not completely intuitive and usable by all customers. It doesn't ship if people with visual, mobility, hearing, cognitive issues, or other disabilities can't easily use it. Six, don't force CX to work the way engineering wants engineering to work. There are ways to bring different domains together on a cross-functional team that don't require every domain to operate the way one domain has chosen to run their ship. Seven, one CX practitioner or a paired CX architect team, as my Delta CX model suggests, is on the Agile or Scrum feature team, not as an outside consultant you talk to when you're not sure where to put a button. Putting us on the team breaks down silos. Make sure there are project and team charters so everybody knows what each person is responsible for and where each role's boundaries are. And eight, Every worker must be held accountable for their work and part of a project. When a project experiences failure or customers are complaining, we have to look at where all of us failed. I would love to be held accountable at a job, and I've never been. So how can CX possibly save time and money when we're adding people, tools, and processes to a process or project? Well, first, there's going to be benefits for portfolio, program, planning, project, and the budget. If we can make sure we're scrapping or postponing those low-value products and features earlier, that's going to save us time and money. Just say no to stakeholder ego projects. 
The second set of benefits will be for engineering. So what you've spent on CX will hopefully be more than made up when engineering isn't guessing, trying to design things themselves, or drowning under change requests. And engineering will save time, money, and sanity after the product release if we used a good CX process. Engineering should have little or no rework. We won't have to spend time finding root causes and problems and stopping to fix them. So remember, think about the entire arc of a software project. There's, uh, without a proper CX process, there is a higher probability that our users are crash test dummies and they're finding the flaws we should have seen and fixed. Now customers have to burn service and support time to get help or report what's hard to use. Or we're going to have to make more training to teach people how to use something that isn't intuitive. Remember that mistakes have costs associated with them. Mistakes the system made. Mistakes the system helped someone make. Mistakes the system didn't stop someone from making. You should see better morale on your teams. People don't enjoy releasing garbage to users. And the flurry of circles on the screen are just some of the time and money we could save by releasing a better product in the first place. I know it looks like adding CX adds time and money to the project, but when CX is done well, it's got a huge ROI across the larger arc and life cycle of our products. Investing in CX helps you identify and reduce cycles of waste. That would be agile. Taking action. We've got to drop faster, 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 and work smarter. We've got to proactively recognize and mitigate risk. Better planning up front. Throw away surveys and guesses about who people are and what we imagine they need. We need better qualitative research data to help us make better customer product and feature decisions. Better strategies, initiatives, and tactical approaches. I haven't found anything in Agility or Lean that says, don't spend extra time up front to do a better job the first time. Agile welcomes customer feedback-driven requirements and changing as we need to. Lean welcomes recognizing problems early, understanding their root causes, and eliminating waste and defects in both our internal processes and the user's experiences. So, Shift away from the fake versions of Agile and Lean that celebrate speed, uh, speed over quality, just shipping it and publicly failing and having to fix it later. Don't believe your own press or the employee handbook that says, we really deliver customer value and we care about customers. All the mindsets and ceremonies on the planet won't matter if we're not delivering products that are easy to learn, easy to use, and matching customers' needs. People cutting corners rush to declare that a product is good enough to release to the public. But what is good enough in the eyes of our customer? Joe Rohde, recently retired senior vice president at Walt Disney Imagineering, said in 2018, one should not be asking the question, how little can we get away with? But rather, how much can we afford to do to be really impressive? This is the quote to hang on the wall. And it's how we start reinventing the customer experience. This is the end. So just a quick reminder that you can find me at Delta CX. I think I've got about five minutes for questions. But first, just uh, find me everywhere on DeltaCX.com and YouTube. And check out our products and services and training and other adventures. And very quickly, because I am the last speaker of the conference, what a super conference, they've asked me to tell you uh, a couple of things. So... Thanks again to everybody attending the DevOps Pro Conference, and thanks to all of the great speakers and partners. Don't forget to rate the sessions you've attended and share your experience on social media. I am not a spokesperson, but I've been asked to read to you a little bit about the sponsors. The platinum sponsor is Sonatype. More than 10 million software developers rely on Sonatype to innovate faster while mitigating security risks inherent in open source. Sonatype's Nexus platform combines in-depth component intelligence with real-time remediation guidance to automate and scale open source governance across every stage of the modern DevOps pipeline. Participate in their campaign to get a free t-shirt. Another platinum sponsor is, and I'm going to say this wrong, Esper Bank? I'm so sorry, a techno technological online service that helps you make purchases without leaving your home. Or is that Sberbank? No, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. It sounds like Burbank, California. Esper Market. Oh, it's not, oh, 
Esper Market and Esper Bank. Okay, we've got both of these. It was created on the basis of the startup Instamart, which joined the Esper ecosystem in 2019. In 2020, Esper Market's R&D team has grown five times and continues to accelerate and expand. Bronze sponsor Lanit is a leading multidisciplinary group of IT companies in Russia and CIS. Currently, Lanit is the largest Russian system integrator and a key partner of more than 280 major global producers of high-tech hardware and software solutions. Lanit provides a full cycle of software development for governmental and commercial organizations, development and implementation of high-load information systems of national, regional, and municipal levels. And our golden sponsor, Flow Health, the number one most downloaded female health app worldwide. Using the power of data, science, AI, and medical experts, the app provides curated cycle and ovulation tracking, personal health insights, expert tips, and a private community for users to ask questions and get support. The Flow team strives to improve the health and well-being of every girl and woman worldwide. Make sure you check their job offers, which are on the Pine platform, as well as on their website. Um, and yes, I'm available to do voice on narrations. So let me stop sharing, and I hope the Pine system doesn't throw me out. Let's see what's in. Okay, I've got one question in Q&A. Hi, Eduardo. It says, should CX research be part of the planning phase to avoid underestimating the requirements or avoid misunderstanding asking the right questions uh, early in the planning phase? Confetti, Eduardo, that would be great. <laughs> I dream of things like that. That would be great. The more research we can do, the better. And talk to your CX and UX partners or agency because sometimes research takes less time than you would think. Um, there are things that we can do in months. There are things that we can do in weeks. And sometimes there's things we can do in days. But the bottom line is, let's not keep falling into these cycles of mistakes and waste. So you're right. We can absolutely incorporate research into planning phases. You can even uh, incorporate it into marketing phases. Um, Justina, hello, Justina or Justina says, sorry, I'm giving everyone English pronunciations, says, are you suggesting to have additional one person to the team when we already have agile coach, coach scrum master, product over, owner in every team? Only because none of them do CX or UX work or none of them do it well. And the problem is when I have seen the CX or UX person outside of the team, they are truly treated as outside of the team. They're siloed, they're disconnected, they're not collaborating, there aren't lines of communication. When developers are coding something that UX created and developers have a question, they make crap up. They go, oh, I'll just figure out a solution for this. That's bad. They should come back to CX and UX and work together on, hey, wait a minute, there's an ambiguity, or wait a minute, there's a problem, or there's something missing from your design. That's a collaboration opportunity, not an opportunity to guess at what each other is good at. So I believe the best way to go is for the person to be on the team so that you know that they are a dedicated resource. Now, of course, they're not an engineering resource, and so they're not going to be utilized the way the other engineers are, but they are part of the team because they do not do what a product owner does, and a product owner does not do what CX and UX do. They might think they do, but trust me, they don't. Let's just say that. All right, let's see. Eduardo is back. How CX skills should be across the organization? Should marketing have a key role in a financial company? Those are two completely separate questions. So should marketing have a key role in a financial company? They probably already do. They probably do. Many companies have chief marketing officers. They have their own branch of the organization and they play very key roles and they get very serious budgets. But very often at companies, CX and UX do not have their own branch of the organization. There is a title, CXO, Chief Experience Officer. That's where CX and UX would be, but very often they're not. So the best place for CX and UX skills uh, would be in their own branch of the organization. The second best place, if we're stuck going for plan B, would be product. It would be good for CX and UX to be part of the product organization because, of course, while we're focused on customer needs and value, we are certainly focused on the product. Um, a little bit from the business side, but very much from the customer side. So that would be um, my plan B. I think I'm out of time. 
I think they're going to throw me out. I'm getting an eight second countdown. So in case this stops, thanks again to everybody for including me. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me. I'm happy to help. And I'm going to have to end the session because my time is in negative numbers. Thank you again, DevOps Pro Europe. Everybody be well.